Great. So we'll just give one more minute for everyone to get settled in. I know we still have some students in the waiting room, but so good to see all of your faces. Those of you whose video is not on, it's still good to see your names. Um, we're really excited to get started today with our speaker. Um, many of you may know this is actually one of the final sessions in our virtual program. So I just wanted to take a minute to say how proud we are of you for going through this long, rigorous journey. So please take a second to, to celebrate yourself and all of the work and engagement that you've put in through all these different sessions. I know many of you have been so diligent about coming to every single one. So please, please, I hope you are so proud of yourselves and we're so proud of you uh, for making it through this journey. You know, many of you have been you know, joining late at night, you're fighting with your siblings to use the computer, you're using all your data, you can't scroll on Instagram because you're attending these sessions. And I know, so we really appreciate the commitment. And the goal of these sessions has been to provide you with, you know, like thinking strategies or practical tools to become generators of change and justice in your communities. And, and we hope you've enjoyed all of these threads coming together. Um, Yes, so we're, we're really excited to, to hand it over to our speaker today. Um, we are being joined by Hans-Peter Feister, who is the Ann Wang Professor of Computer Science at the Harvard uh, School of Engineering and Applied Sciences and an affiliate faculty member at the Center for Brain Science. Um, his research in visual computing lies at the intersection of visualization, computer graphics, and computer vision and spans a wide range of topics, including biomedical visualization, image and video analysis, 3D fabrication, and visual anal uh, analytics in data science. So we're so excited to hand it over to him. Uh, Hans Peter, over to you. Thank you so much, Tiara, and welcome everyone. It's great to see all of you. So if you're able, please turn on your video. So I have a little bit more of a personal touch here. Um, I understand this is the last session that stands between you and the beginning of summer. So thank you all for joining. And, you know, I'm excited to be here and I'm looking forward to talking with you about data visualization. So let me start sharing my screen. And looking at There we go. Tiara, I think I found the magic setting. Great. That's so I good. should be all set. Let me arrange my Zoom grid here so I see as many of you as possible. Great. Can you see the screen okay? We can see the screen. Also, just a reminder before, Hans-Peter, before you get started, please try to stay on topic in the chat. That's very important. Please don't... Uh, uh, DBA to talk about anything else. And also remember that, that the grounding principle of Crossroads is compassion. So please, all of your interactions with each other, um, all of your interactions with, with, with the professor and everyone in the Crossroads community, please ground them in compassion, open-mindedness, and, and we're excited to hand it over now. Sorry, thank you. Yes, thank you. And yes, I will be using the chat. So uh, please make sure you have the chat window open because I'm gonna ask you a couple of questions during activities. All right, so um, data visualization, you know, I, I know you've used this since probably elementary school. So, and I know you see it um, daily in the news, right? So this is just a couple examples from the news in the US. So on the left is a visualization of the job losses at the beginning of the COVID crisis of the pandemic. And it, they put literally a bar chart across the whole front page, which I've never seen before quite dramatic. And of course, the job losses at the time were also very dramatic. And similarly, in my local paper, the Boston Globe, um, you, we see daily corona you know, visualizations um, on the upper right here, basically showing you the number of infections and the number of deaths. And I'm sure you're all familiar with, with these curves. And I'm sure you've also heard that we had elections in the US last year. So we had a lot of visualizations about elections, in particular election maps. 
So I don't need to explain to you basically what visualizations are, but I do want to ask the question, how would you define visualization? So as our first sort of warm-up activity, I'd like you to just think for a minute, what is visualization and how would you define it in a sentence or in a few words? So once you have you know, some idea what visualization is, put it in the chat and everyone take a look at what you guys came up with. Visual representation of data, yes. Maybe we can add a little bit more about the purpose of visualization to that definition. To spice up a topic, okay. To analyze, yes. Communication, yes. Storytelling. Formation of a mental image, interesting, yes. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Clear understanding, understanding of the data. Good, yes, I think you got, you got it. Good, so um, I just give you the broadest definition that I could come up with. It's conveying information, right? Conveying information through graphical representations of data. So what's important here is that visualizations are always connected to data. And so if they're not connected to data, they're basically just graphical designs. And that's fine, but that is not a visualization. So a visualization by definition has to have a connection to data and we're trying to convey information. Now there is fundamentally two goals for visualizations. The first one is to allow people to explore the data and you know, I just put up this example here that came up in the New York Times last year. This is a Corona simulator. It basically allows you to pick some parameters on the left that will then change the curve that you're seeing here on the right. And some of the parameters are, you know, what kinds of interventions are you going to do? Um, where is this happening in the US or in the world? What is the level of the intervention? Is it moderate or is it severe? Um, and then other parameters were like, you know, how long is the infection period, et cetera, et cetera. So given these parameters that you could interactively choose, you can then see the result of that simulation on the right. And this is a great example of exploring a topic interactively by looking at a visualization, right? So it helps us explore the data. It helps us getting some sense of how do we understand these curves that we've been seeing literally daily uh, for the last year and a half? Another goal of visualization is to explain. And here we're talking about communication. We're communicating to an audience and we're trying to explain something to the audience, some insights that we actually already have from the data. So we're not exploring the data anymore. We've actually finished exploration, and now we're ready to explain the data to somebody else. And there's many forms of that. On the left you see, and on the right, you see a couple examples of so-called infographics. They use human recognizable objects typically to sort of draw you into the visualization. And then they use you know, very simple visualizations to kind of explain some facts about the phenomena. And then in the middle, you see a couple examples of data journalism. Again, these are visualizations that basically explain something to the reader. So on the top is you know, the effectiveness of the measles vaccine. The black line is when it was introduced. And then the colors show you when they stopped having measles infections in all of the states in the US. So you can see that after the introduction of the vaccine, basically measles was eradicated in the US. And similarly, on the bottom, you have a map that shows you obesity rates in the US. And again, this is a data journalism, basically a, a sort of communication of data through visualizations. Now, uh, why do we need visualization and why are they so popular right now? Well, the main reason is data, right? So we have too much of it. I don't need to explain this to you. 
Maybe what's a little surprising is most of this data is not just collected by humans anymore. It's actually collected by machines. And you, I've heard the term, the industrial revolution of data. And I think that sort of captures this idea. So, you know, your smart devices that you might be wearing, your cell phones, um, any sort of devices you might have at home, for example, an internet router or anything like that, all of these devices collect data that they sometimes share with you, but more often than not actually share with third parties. And so all of this data is massive and by now actually exceeds by far the amount of data that is collected by humans. So we have all this data, but the problem is, you know, that doesn't really mean we understand what's going on. We can't really make sense of all the data without some help. And so Herbert Simon phrased it as such. He says, a wealth of information creates a poverty of attention because our attention is limited, right? We can't pay attention to too many things at once. Now, fortunately, we can use the power of our visual system. About half of the neurons in the brain are dedicated to processing of visual information. So that's a lot of brain power. And we can use that through visualization to actually make this information, this data, more understandable. And to show you the power of perception, I'm going to show you a string of letters. I'm going to ask how many letter V, 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 <laughs> do you see in this string of letters? When you know it, please put the number in the chat. So uh, here we go. How many letter V? So I'm going to keep counting. It's more than one. Yes, so I see the right answer now, four. It's four, right? But it took you some time. And it took you some time because you had to literally scan sequentially through the string of letters. But if I ask you how many letter V do you see here, you immediately recognize it, right? You don't have to spend much time counting. It's a parallel process. We're actually seeing all of this information in parallel through the visual system. And even before you consciously are aware of it, you immediately see that these Vs stand out because of their color and because they're more bold. So that's the power of perception that we can use to help us understand data. And Don Norman, who's a human computer interaction researcher said, it is things that make us smart. So we can actually offload some of our mental cognitive uh, load into external things. So we, you know, humanity has done this pretty much since the beginning, since we started thinking. And so we started having cave paintings. And then of course we have books and printed pictures. And now we have interactive visualizations on the web to really offload this cognitive load from the data into something external. And so uh, Stuart Card, another human computer interaction researcher says, Visualization is about external cognition, right? It's sort of offloading things externally to the mind so that how resources outside of the mind can be used to boost the cognitive capabilities of the mind. And so that's important. That's an important concept. So visualizations externalize our thinking just like books do, just like you know when you doodle, just like when you take notes um, and they help us make sense of information. So then the question becomes, what is an effective visualization? Well, it's easier to answer what is not effective, right? So I can already tell you this is a not effective visualization because it hides information. It's, you know, it's too cluttered. And this one too, it's a 3D visualization, uh, which is typically bad. But the question is, you know, why? Why are these not effective? There's actually a website called uh, WTF Visualizations that collects all of these bad examples of visualizations. So I'm gonna show you one of those. And um, one of the activities that we're gonna do now is 
to have you think about what makes this visualization ineffective. So um, I'd like you to think about it for a couple minutes, and then I'll give you a prompt. And when I give you the prompt, you can start putting your thoughts into the chat. Okay, so the question is, what makes this visualization ineffective? There is multiple reasons. Um, you can focus on one or you can focus on many. So I'll, I'll show you the bigger version of this. Think about it for a couple minutes by yourselves. And then after some time, after two minutes, I'll give you a prompt and then you can put your answers in the chat. Uh, don't answer just yet. I appreciate the enthusiasm, but let's wait with your answers in the chat till I give you the prompt so that everyone has a chance to think about it first. give you one more minute to think about it and then you can answer in the chat so just wait with the chat for another minute think about it again there could be multiple reasons why it's ineffective for those of you just joining the question here is why is this visualization ineffective All right, so uh, put your answers in the chat. And everyone take a look at all of the reasons that you guys came up with. So I see Claire, I believe is that's how you pronounce your name. Uh, the shape does not allow for percentages to be represented well. A circle would do better. Correct. So like this, you know, hexagon here is kind of weird, right? So it's it's a weird shape because it actually makes these, you know, these uh, shapes here very irregular. And for us, it's kind of difficult to judge area between those really irregularly shaped um, kind of wedges. Um, Zara says 25% and 40% don't make sense. Uh, Zara, do you quickly want to unmute and tell us what you mean by that? Uh, that's, this is uh, Zara Jabin, Tiara. Zara, are you able to unmute yourself? Uh, hello. Hi, Zara. You say 25 Hi, and 40% um, don't make sense. What do you mean by that? Yeah, because 25 should be uh, smaller than 40%. 40% in, uh, indicates more percentage than 25. So that's what I meant. Yes, exactly. So um, there's two errors, right? Really like the, first of all, the number doesn't correspond to the area that they're actually yes. showing. And then, as you said, of course, 25% should be over here. And they even made it bigger in terms of the font, which is kind of weird. So it's it seems to be a deliberate error. <laughs> But yes, so that's a mistake, <clears throat> absolutely. Okay, so let's see. Um, I see lots of comments about shapes and percentages, no scale of measurement. Well, that's actually okay because we're talking about percentages of a whole and um, actually surprisingly, um, you know, 40, let's see, 60, Yes, and 40. So this adds up to 100%, which is good news, right? So we're talking about percentages of a whole. So it has to be adding up. Uh, Humayun, can you explain what you mean? The statements are repeating quite the same thing. 
Uh, hello? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, yes, sir. Sir, I mean that the, they are again and again repeating about autism. At once, they have described autism recurrence rate in families. And again, they are going for the specifics. Autistic children have intellectual disabilities because these things are understood and they are again and again describing these things. Okay, so you're right. There is something weird about those annotations and you know about those categories. Um, think about it in a little bit of a different way. I just said that these things add up to a whole, right? So let me ask you, do you think these categories make sense if you sort of think of them as adding up to something whole? And what is that whole thing? Maybe somebody else. So what is wrong with these categories? Just put it in the chat. Yeah, I see Muhammad. No uniformity. All four describe different aspects of top of autism. Correct. Um, see if there's somebody else here about they don't talk about the same thing. Yes, Sarah. Yes, it's about causes, right? Yes. Um, so the problem is there is overlap between the categories, right? They're not exclusive. So, you know, think about it. Here we have kind of what's happening with aut autistic children. Um, they have communication disabilities. Uh, they might have genetic disorders, but these are not mutually exclusive, right? So both of these things can be true. Um, and then here is completely different information. There is a recurrence rate in family. Um, and again, here is sort of more of a symptom. They might have intellectual disabilities. So we have on one hand symptoms, on the other hand, we have some causes potentially, and maybe even some information about recurrence rates. All of these things could be true at the same time. So they're not mutually exclusive. They're not part of one whole thing. So that's a fundamental flaw in this. Okay, good. So that's a bad, ineffective visualization. So I haven't answered the question yet. Well, what makes the visualization effective? And that's actually what we're going to talk about in the rest of the hour. So my sort of high level definition is that an effective visualization uses the power of perception to offload cognition. So we just talked about the power of perception. We want to use that power effectively so that we don't have to think too much, right? Um, this visualization here, among many other things, makes you think too much, and it doesn't really give you the information in an easy way. And, and once you start looking at it, it really doesn't make sense. So we want to do better. So I'm going to talk about four things that make visualizations effective. They have to have graphical integrity. They're going to have to be simple. They use the right kind of display, and they use color strategically. Um, there is more. I could have also talked about storytelling, et cetera. But in the interest of time, I'm just going to focus on those four and we'll do some exercises or activities as we go along. So the first one is they must have graphical integrity. In other words, they must be true, right? Um, so um, what is wrong with this visualization here? This was shown on Fox News which is uh, one of the news channels in the US. And the title is, if Bush tax cuts expire, and then you can see what's happening to the top tax rate. So here is a bigger picture of the same one. So in the chat, uh, put in your opinion, what's wrong with this? Good, I see two right answers already. So the graphic doesn't correspond to the percentage. Good, but um, why do I say that this is a bad visualization? I mean, exactly what did they do wrong to make those percentages not be correct? The scaling is wrong, yes. What is wrong about the scaling? Can somebody be more specific? Yes, you all you all see that the percentages don't quite show up in the correct way, but why? The scale is exaggerated, okay. Can you say something a little bit more about why it's exaggerated? There is a very simple answer. What is wrong with the scale here shown on the right? 
Yes, Umit, you got it. The vertical axis did not start at zero, right? Um, there's not many sort of hard rules in visualization, but this is one of them. It's a hard rule. You can never violate this. Bar charts always have to start at zero because what we're judging is the length of the bar. So here is a comparison of the original visualization on the left and of the correct visualization on the right with a zero-based axis. And you can see that visually the difference between the two percentages on the right is much less than on the left. And so that is a problem of perception because it's actually exaggerating in the display the difference between the percentages because it doesn't use a zero-based bar chart. Okay, so always use zero-based scales for bar charts. What about uh, this visualization here? This is from a presentation by Steve Jobs, I think about a year after the iPhone was introduced. It's showing you the US smartphone market share. And you know he's showing you different companies. Um, RIM, the blue one, they used to make the BlackBerry. I don't know if you guys remember that, but <laughs> that used to be a smartphone before we all had iPhones or, or whatever we have now. Um, Apple is in green here, right? So that's the iPhone. And then there is Palm and Motorola, et cetera. What strikes you as maybe ineffective or maybe untruthful about this visualization here? Yeah, Fizra, it's misleading, but why? So Muhammad says 19.5% is bigger than 21.2%. Yes, Muhammad, you're right. So if you look at this wedge here, right, it seems to be bigger in terms of just number of pixels. It actually is bigger than this here. And, and what is the reason? Again, what is the reason in terms of what did they do wrong with the visual? Oh, Yasmin says it doesn't count to 100. I didn't do the math. Maybe somebody can check. It definitely should be. Yes. Um, join it. I don't know if I pronounced that correctly. He has said it's tilted. Correct. So this is using a 3D pie chart, right? Um, and because of that perspective distortion from the tilt, you actually see this border down here, which makes it appear bigger than the purple up here. So if I go just into a 2D pie graph, I actually get a better representation compared to this 3D. So 3D is typically bad. Um, if you really were interested in showing the differences accurately, so if it's really about the percentages, you should use a bar chart because a bar chart makes it a lot easier to compare actual absolute numbers. And again, has to start at zero, right? And if you do a bar chart of the same data, you actually see that Apple is really number three after the other category. And you might ask yourself, who is in this other category? So that could be an interesting question. Good. So the point of this section is that, you know, I'm not accusing any of these organizations or, or you know, Fox News or Steve Jobs um, of lying. However, I would say that they've used distorted visualizations to make a point. And hence, I would say, yes, that visualization has been lying to us. And once you're starting to lie with the visualization, you lose integrity, meaning you basically lose the trust of the audience. And trust is one of those commodities that is very easy to lose and very hard to gain. So you do not want to ever deliberately or inadvertently lie with your visualization. So you better check before you make a visualization public that is actually accurately depicting the data. Okay, so uh, what about this visualization here? Um, you know, it's not necessarily lying, although it is using 3D, but there is something else wrong with this. What, what's wrong with this one here? Maybe in the chat. Too complicated, yes. Can you be a little more specific? What is too complicated? Too much information? Sure, just say it. Yes, a lot of categories, right? Unreadable, yes. So, you know, clearly way too many categories. It has basically a couple of problems. One is we have a long list of categories here on the right. I can actually show this to you in bigger. So we have all these categories here. 
And then the color scale here is trying to show us, in this case, I guess, I don't know how many. I'm just taking a guess, like 30 or so categories with different colors. That's way too many, right? We cannot distinguish many of these colors. Um, I'm going to tell you later, I mean, when we talk about color, but fundamentally, you can only use about eight to maybe 10 different colors if you have categories. So don't use too many colors. And then, of course, it becomes way too cluttered. So all of these wedges over here are basically overlapping. We can't really distinguish where these labels here go to which wedge. And, you know, the 3D effect, again, is distorting the data. So that's actually kind of untruthful as well. Uh, yes, Jainet, you have a question? Did I pronounce your name correctly? I'm sorry. Uh, my, yes, you pronounce it correctly. It is, I pronounce it as Junai. Junai, uh, so okay. My question to you is, my question to you is that which data visualization tools should we use? Should we go for Power BI or should we go for Tableau? Or there is, if there is a other tools? Yes, that's an excellent question. So there is, as you said, there is several tools. I personally use Tableau in my courses because Tableau has a free student license. So if you're a student at a college, you can go to Tableau. I'll put the name in the chat tableau and they have basically a educational program that first of all gives professors free licenses but also gives students a free license um you know assuming you're using it for you know your personal use you can't use it commercially obviously um and you have to kind of prove that you are a student so you have to sh you know show some registration information from your university but that's that's very nice Power BI is also very popular. Power BI from Microsoft, especially for people who already have a lot of Microsoft software. So if you're in a company where they already use, you know, Microsoft Word and Excel and um, Office and whatever, um, then Power BI, I think, is a natural choice because it's coming from Microsoft and, you know, it sort of ties nicely into that ecosystem. Um, I would say in terms of the ease of use, both of them are very similar. Uh, however, Tableau is a little bit more powerful. So there is a little bit of a trade-off there. Um, but, you know, both of them are really good choices. Now, the most popular tool for visualization in the world is actually Excel, Microsoft Excel. So most people do visualizations in Excel. And you can actually do really good things. One thing I would say, though, is do not use just the defaults. So when you create a chart in Excel using the chart wizard, typically the defaults are not optimal. So you have to actually tinker with it a little bit more, um, hopefully using the principles we're talking about today to make sure that it's simple, that you use the right colors, et cetera, et cetera. I hope that's helpful. All right, good. So um, yes, so this is not effective because it's way too complex. And that's my next point of advice here. For effective visualizations, you should really keep it simple. Now, you know, this is common sense. <laughs> I, I know you're probably all nodding now. Yes, of course. But you'd be surprised how many people don't follow this advice. So that's why I make it at number two after having uh, integrity. Um, so um, Edward Tufty, who is a big name in visualization because he wrote a couple of famous books. He has this measure called the data ink ratio. It's a little bit playful. It's not entirely serious, but the idea is to compare how many pixels in this case, or how much ink is used on data compared to the total ink or the total number of pixels used in the visualization, right? And you wanna maximize that ratio. In other words, you wanna make sure that most of your pixels are actually used to show data. So if you have a 3D bar chart like this, um, it's actually not very efficient based on this data ink ratio because there is a lot of pixels here, like on the top and on the side from this 3D effect, including the pixels from the shadow here that are not really communicating data. So a visualization that is just a 2D depiction is actually more effective because you don't have this wasted you know, pixels on the 3D effect. 
And this is a general rule. 2D visualizations are always, in my opinion, except for scientific data, more effective. So unless you have a 3D phenomena like, a, you know, wind flow over a turbine or um, some water flow, et cetera, where the 3D information is important, um, you should really stick to just 2D visualizations and don't use those fancy 3D effects that they give you in Excel and you know, PowerPoint, et cetera. So uh, another one of Tufti's rule is to avoid what he calls chart junk, which is any visual element that distract from the message, right? That distract from the data. So in the chat here, tell me, uh, what can we remove from this visualization without changing the message or without changing the actual data? The grid, yes. So let's remove the grid. What else? Next thing. Any other ideas? Calibration of background color. Okay, so let's remove the background color. Good. Um, we can actually also, by, by calibration lines, I, I think what you mean is the tick marks, right? So yes, the top and the right border line, gone. Uh, we can start removing some of the tick marks here. Um, so actually, first I removed the vertical line here, and then I introduced white lines here, which is a nice optical trick here. So this white line here actually gives you a nice indication of where these percentages are. And then at that point, I can get rid of the tick marks. So this is the most minimal representation of this bar chart. Um, maybe it's going a little bit too far, you know, like, but this is as minimal as it gets, right? Without losing any information. And so whenever you do a visualization in any tool, you should always ask yourself, what can I remove without, you know, introducing any distortion into the communication of the data? So remove all of the chart junk. And whatever you do, do not do these things. <laughs> These are things you can find on the internet, right? So it's not that I made that up. I mean, people have actually spent time producing these things. I especially like the 3D bar chart on the lower left with the banana textures. <laughs> so um, yes, Brandon has a question. And by the way, please uh, ask questions in the chat. You can also raise your hand. Either way is fine. Um, so um, what is the name of the course I teach at Harvard? It's called uh, CS171. I put it in the chat, visualization. And it's also available through the Harvard Extension School as E171 visualization. Um, Harvard Extension School. The Harvard Extension School is a really nice program. Now it's not free, unfortunately. Um, so it costs money, but this is something you might want to look at, especially after you graduate college. I think right now you're still, you know, you're busy enough taking your courses, <clears throat> but once you graduate college, I really encourage you to keep learning, right? Take courses so you can take them through the extension school. They're all online, so you can take them anywhere in the world. And um, yeah, my course is offered there as well. All right. So I see a lot of me too's. Um, I think. Oh, I'm not. I'm sorry. I just. I think I just did a direct response to who was asking the question. Let me quickly put this into the general chat. Sorry about that. So CS one seventy one is my Harvard class, but that's only for Harvard student. But it, the same course is offered through the Extension School as E one seventy one. All right, so uh, number three on what makes a visualization effective is using the right kind of display. And so the question is, what do I mean by right? So um, what I mean is something that is effective from perceptual science point of view. In perceptual science, people have studied what types of encodings, so-called encodings, are most effective. And, you know, this literally 30 years of studies um, that have shown over and over again which of these different encodings are more effective than others. And here is just a sort of collection of a few of those. 
Um, I want to do kind of an unscientific experiment with you guys just to give you a sense for how vision science actually evaluates visualization effectiveness, just to, you know, to give you kind of an idea of where these encodings and where this ranking I'm going to show you come from. And after we do this unscientific experiment, I'll show you the result of all of these studies that have been done scientifically. Okay, so the experiments all have sort of a similar form. They show you a visualization and then they ask you to make some comparison. So in this case, it's a bar chart. And the question here is, how much longer is the bar shown in B compared to the bar shown in A? And so if you know the answer, put it in the chat. It's a whole number. I can tell you right now, it's a whole number. So how much longer is B compared to A? I see some threes, I see fours. The correct answer is four. So if you kind of look at A, you know, it fits four times into the length of B. How much steeper is the slope shown in A compared to the slope shown in B? Again, it's a whole number. How much steeper is the slope? Twice, can't say, twice, three times. I haven't seen the right answer yet. There it is, four times, yes. So again, it's four times steeper. Now, this is harder than the previous one, right? Because we have a harder time judging slopes, especially comparing slopes. So that's the kind of information that vision science gets at. This is harder than the previous one. So slope comparisons are more difficult than length comparisons. How much larger is the area shown in B compared to the area shown in A? Again, it's a whole number. Five, three, eight, 16, four, four, six, seven, four, four, three. Okay, most of you got it wrong. Um, it is seven times larger. And most of you underestimated it, right? We actually typically underestimate area. I can kind of visually prove to you that it's seven times bigger by overlaying A on top of B. So you kind of see seven of these A circles kind of fit into the B thing. How much darker is the intensity shown in B compared to the intensity shown in A? How much darker? Two times, three times, three times. Yeah, so it is two times darker just by the intensity values. Okay, so this is more difficult again because um, we actually are not really good photometers, right? We can't really absolutely judge intensities. And even the comparison is, is kind of tricky. Here again is kind of a visual proof that the one on the right is probably twice as dark as the one on the left, but it also depends on your monitor. It actually depends, you know, uh, on Zoom, quite frankly, on the kind of compression they do, et cetera. Now, this one is the last one. Uh, how much bigger is the value shown by the color in B compared to the color in A? And to answer this, you need to look at the color scale on the lower right. So how much bigger is the value encoded by the color in B? Lots of wrong answers. I see one right answer so far. Yes, so I see a couple more. So four. So this yellow here is roughly in the middle. So this middle here is a value of eight. The green here is on the left, which is a value of two. So two and eight, so that's four times larger, right? Now, this one, of course, um, took more of your mental capacities. You had to actually do some math in your head and you had to match colors. So that actually is cognitively definitely more intensive than some of the previous ones. Okay, so again, this was just sort of give you a flavor of the types of experiments people do in vision science to study visualizations. And of course they do other types of experiments as well. So I'm gonna show you the results of like 30 years of vision science in one slide now. Um, this is from most to least efficient, showing you the different so-called visual channels or visual encodings that you can use in visualization. So the most efficient one is actually position because we're very good at judging relative position on a 2D screen. 
The next one is length. As you probably remember, the length judgment of the bar charts was relatively easy. Angle or slope is harder, right? That comes next. Area is even harder, so that's actually even less precise, it turns out. And then intensity and color and shape are actually the least efficient. They're, they're the hardest for us to do. Now, given this ranking from most to least efficient, we can actually assign that to different types of data. So if you have quantitative data, you should actually use the most efficient channels. So to express any kind of quantitative you know, number, you want to use position, length, slope, and angle. Anything that's ordered, like from small to large or from minimum to maximum, you can actually use area and intensity because we can judge the relative sort of ordering relatively simple, right? We see small to large areas easily, and we see light to dark intensities easily. And then color and shape are really only useful for categories. Now, given this information, we can actually think about which ones of our standard visualizations are more or less effective. So the most effective visualizations are the ones that we always use. <laughs> Maybe not surprisingly, they're sort of the statistical visualizations you're all familiar with. So a dot plot, a line chart, they're using position, right? Um, and of course, a bar chart, which uses length. Next and less effective are pie charts. A pie chart actually uses both area and angle, but as you know, both of these are not sort of perfect for us to judge. And the donut chart showing on the lower left is kind of a poor cousin of a pie chart. It's using, it, it's losing the middle here. So it's losing the angle. So all we have is basically judging area and that's harder than having both area and angle. And least effective, unfortunately, is color, in particular, when we use color to encode quantitative information. And I say, unfortunately, because we use actually color to encode quantitative information on maps very frequently, right? So here is a so-called area map or a choropleth map using color to encode data. And it's unfortunately not very effective in particular because the color scale that they chose is very bad. And the reason it's bad is that this is showing a precipitation, I mean, rain, stuff coming from the sky, rain or snow um, in the United States. And if you look at this visually, it seems like, oh my God, you know, all of the rain is falling on the East Coast and there is almost no rain on the West Coast. Well, that's not true for anyone who has lived on the West Coast, especially in Oregon and Portland, um, you know that there's a lot of rain in the Pacific Northwest. So um, the problem is that the color chart is actually not effective. But in general, color is just not very good at conveying quantitative information because it does require a color map. And as we saw before, that is more cognitively intensive than other visualizations. And whatever you do, uh, do not do this. <laughs> Somebody had the glorious idea to come up with a new type of pie chart, uh, which, you know, cognitively speaking, is just not effective because we really have no clue how to read this. I don't even know what the areas mean. Um, they don't seem to make any sense. So anyway, don't invent new visualizations just for the fun of it. Uh, stick with the classics and you'll be fine. All right, good. Um, yes, speaking of color, right? So that's my next topic. <clears throat> Use color strategically. So um, what do you think of this visualization here? This is an election map, which was published, by the way, and I can show you the big version. Uh, it shows the margins of victory between George Bush and John Kerry. And if you remember, John, uh, George Bush won that election. Um, yeah, what do you think of this? And by the way, it also has voter turnout as a percentage of voting age population using this encoding here. Too many bright colors hurt my eyes. Yes, Rebecca, I agree. Definitely too bright, very, very vibrant. It's too saturated, yes.
hard to decode. So uh, Sunita and others, uh, what is hard to decode? Like, can you be more specific? Voter turnout percentage should have more uh, categories. Yes, it's kind of coarse here. Zero, you know, only three categories here. Colors are random. Okay, good. So um, talk about the colors. What is bad about the colors? Except that they're too bright. I heard that already. Too many colors. Okay. The parties are not specified. Well, anyone in the US would know the parties. George Bush is Republican, John Kerry is Democrat. Also, they try to be sort of party, uh, true to the parties with their colors. So blue for Democrats, right? Red for Republicans. Um, could have been only two colors, maybe. Yeah, so they wanted to actually show the margin of victories in different percentages. If you look at the percentage categories here, they're really weird, right? So 0 to 10.47. Why? <laughs> Why? Why do you need two percentage points after the comma for, for this chart here? That doesn't make any sense. And then, you know, from 10 to 17, from 17, and it has a lot of categories for the lower percentages. And then 33 to 100 is its own category. So again, it's, it's really weird and doesn't really make sense. And again, uses a lot of our cognitive power to actually read this map. The, the information doesn't jump at us. And so the color map is fundamentally bad. However, it's bad for another reason too. And I think I saw the reason earlier, but not before, I, I actually before I showed this map here. And the reason is that this map is really terrible for people who have color deficiencies or are colorblind, as we say. Um, they're actually not colorblind, they just see colors differently than we do, than quote unquote normal color vision. So here is a simulation what a red green colorblind person would see in this map. And as you can see immediately, all of the red look the same more or less, right? They have this weird kind of greenish brownish color. Um, and so you lose all distinct distinction between those different colors. So that's my first and maybe most important tip for colors, which is you have to consider people that are colorblind. There is three types of colorblindness. The most common one is a deficiency in the red or green channels that we have in our eyes. You probably know we have cones for color vision. We actually have three types of cones. You can think of them as red, green, and blue. And so the red and green cones might be affected in those people. And that leads to this kind of blindness for distinction between red and green. And it turns out about 10% of the male population in the world have some form of red, green color deficiency. 10%, that's a lot. <laughs> now, um, color blindness it sort of seems to indicate it's a binary thing, but as, as all things in life, nothing is really truly binary, right? There's actually a spectrum of color deficiencies. So some people may not be completely colorblind. They can still see red and green, but they see the difference between red and green less you know, clearly than other people. By the way, the percentage for women is much, much lower. It's, I forget the number, but it's, I think, less than 2%. So men are predominantly more affected by this. There is a third kind of colorblindness that affects the blue cones, which is much, much rarer. That's less than a percent of the population. All right, so how do you check for colorblindness in your visualizations? There is this wonderful colorblindness simulator, which is in the slides. Um, I can actually put the link in the chat. And I believe you will get the slides after the session. So you can also check the slides later. But this simulator is great because it allows you to, first of all, here, upload a file. So what you should do is you should take a screenshot of your visualization from whatever tool you used, Excel, PowerPoint, Power BI, Tableau, whatever. Choose a file, um, basically an image file of that visualization and upload it to the simulator. And then you have different choices here. You can, of course, look at it normally. 
But then the ones I recommend is really this here, this green, red, green blindness, either red blind or green blind. Um, so that's the, the ones you want to check, basically. And then if you, this is a picture of crayons. If you do that, you'll realize very quickly that most of the time, your visualizations will actually not be effective for people with colorblindness. And that also brings me to a next important point, which is avoid rainbow colors. There is a, you know, kind of a culture, I would say, especially in science, to use a rainbow color map, which is you know, shown most clearly here. It goes from blue through red with all colors of the rainbow in between. And first of all, and that, by the way, this one kind of that we looked at follows a rainbow palette as well. First of all, as we just saw, this is bad for people that are colorblind, right? So again, 10% of the male population, that's a lot of people. And secondly, it turns out that the rainbow scale is actually perceptually not uniform. And what I mean by that is that the, the yellows and, you know, to some extent, the greens and some of the brighter reds really stick out visually much more than the blues and maybe the darker greens. And so, for example, in this weather map here, um, the red zones really stick out, whereas, you know, potentially that's not really the information in the data. It could be that some other areas here are equally important, but they're kind of masked by the predominance of the yellows and the reds. And unfortunately, you know, as I mentioned, weather maps use rainbow colors typically, um, climate change maps use them, etc. So there is a you know, really abundance of rainbow color maps, but they're both bad because of the perceptual non-uniformity and also because they're not really appropriate for color blindness. So please avoid them. Okay, so uh, that brings me to the end and we're right on the top of the hour, which is good. Um, I could of course tell you more, but you know, I think this is sort of the main information I want you to keep in mind from this session. Have graphical integrity, right? Don't lie with charts. Don't lie with statistics. Don't lie with words. Basically, have integrity. And that's just the bottom line sort of message. And I know you're all trying, but just make sure whenever you put out a visualization that it actually truthfully represents the data. Keep it simple. Don't go crazy. I think the basic visualizations are typically the right choice. Use the right kind of display. Go back to that slide I showed you with the effectiveness of the different visual encodings and use the ones that are most appropriate most often, right? So if you have quantitative data, use position and length. And then use color carefully and strategically and be mindful of color blindness. So um, let me just end with two recommendations for further reading before I answer questions. Um, the book here on the left, Storytelling with Data, is a great introduction to visualization. It covers what I just told you, plus many other ideas, including storytelling. And so it's the book I use also, um, you know, in my class uh, as a recommended reading. So I think it's a really nice read and it's relatively simple to read. So I recommend it. I think you, you will enjoy that. The one on the right is uh, one of the books from Edward Tufte, who I mentioned earlier. You know, he came up with the data ink ratio and chart chunk and graphical integrity and many other terms. He actually has, you know, written four or five books by now, but the first one that he wrote, The Visual Display of Quantitative Information, is a classic. So again, if you're interested in visualization, um, I recommend this book. It's a perfect example of beautiful design as well. And it has lots of, you know, examples of good and bad visualizations. Good, so that's all I have. Uh, thank you all for attending and being actively engaged in the chat. I really appreciate it. And now we have some time, I believe, for answering questions, right, Tiara? Yes, uh, we definitely have time for a couple questions. Um, so for Q&A, um, you can raise your hands and, and we will call on you or um, you can send your question in the chat and Professor Fester will pull it out of the chat. I know, Subarshan, you have your hand up. So maybe we can go to you first or Hans-Peter, unless you... Yeah, no, you go ahead, uh, Subarshan. You can, you can unmute, yeah. Thanks a lot, Professor. It's a, it's a really insightful session. So 
uh, I had a question like, you know, basically I used to work with a lot of data and most of the times in my uh, firm, I make a lot of presentations utilizing this uh, graphical representation of data. So my question is like these days, uh, you know, uh, as you explained, like previously, like there were several uh, different, different types of graphs you were using to represent data. So currently there's a new trend that is animated data visualization. So what is your say on that? Yes, that's a great question. I think animation can be very powerful and very effective. In particular, transitions between charts, right? So um, we call them sometimes uh, scrolly telling visualizations because typically what happens on a website, you have to scroll typically up and down, right? And then it sort of animates. It's almost like an animated story with data. And in my opinion, that can be very effective. Um, if it is done well, right? So um, you need to basically use some of the principles we talked about and maybe some others to just make sure that the animation is effective and that it's not a gimmick. But if you use transitions between different you know, visualizations and if you show sort of in a scrolly telling kind of way, you know, a visualization and maybe some text and then a visualization and maybe more text, you can tell really effective data stories. So yes, I'm a fan of that. Good Thank question. You. Thank you. Um, John, uh, John Yet, I still don't get it right, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, my question to you is that I was contemplating whether to go for a master's in data science. So it would be really helpful if you could shed some lights on the career opportunities in data science. Yes, great question. So I was the director of the master's program in data science at Harvard, and I'm still on the steering committee. Um, so I'm a big fan of masters in data science. I think they're fantastic. Now, unfortunately, they're not cheap, right? So they do cost money. And, you know, that I think limits, unfortunately, the sort of number of participants that come in. Good news is we have worked pretty hard at Harvard to come up with fellowships and scholarships. And so this year, we've actually given out several scholarships to incoming students. However, just to be clear, um, at least for the Harvard program, we admit very, very few students, only about 60 per year, six zero per year. Um, and we get, you know, close to 2000 applications. So it's, it's very competitive. Um, again, unfortunately, however, there are other master's programs. Georgia Tech has a pretty large one, which I believe is fully online. That could be of interest. And I believe it's it's cheaper, not free, but it's cheaper. And, and I think it's also very popular. So there is several in the US at least that I'm aware of. Um, in terms of career paths in data science, you don't need a master's to be a data scientist, right? It does help, but you don't necessarily need it. So I think anyone concentrating in sort of a data science related area like computer science, statistics, math, applied math, um, any of those areas will actually be good career choices for becoming a data scientist. And even if you didn't choose one of those areas, there is lots of you know, need for people that know about communication in data science. So you can actually be a team member in a data science team with different backgrounds, in particular, you know, maybe in the humanities, and effectively contribute to the data storytelling. So that's one of the beautiful things about data science. It's a very broad field and it, it requires lots of different talents. And so I think organizations have realized to, to put together basically data science teams with a diverse set of backgrounds and a diverse set of people. So um, I definitely encourage all of you to think about that and maybe look into it. Uh, Brandon. Thank you for the session. I have a question. Are there any difference to present data to children and adults? Uh, because uh, I usually work with children and I don't know if the principles that you present in this lecture is, are the same to present to younger people. That's a really interesting question. Thank you. Um, yes. So. There is actually research on visualization for children and actually in the community, there is some growing interest in, in working in that direction. Um, I wouldn't say the community, the academic community has come up with very clear guidelines yet. 
However, the observation is that children are actually extremely good at making visualizations if you give them the right tools. For example, an effective way is giving them tangible tools. So I've seen, you know, visualizations done with Lego blocks by children that are fantastic, absolutely fantastic. So they build bar charts and they even build, you know, other types of 3D type visualizations. Um, in that case, the sort of principles we talked about don't really apply, right? Because you're building stuff with, with actual tangible things. So that, that's a whole different set of, of guidelines there. Um, and then the other one that's really great for children is, of course, sketching, which, again, may have different principles. You know, it's less precise. You can be more um, inventive, more creative. So, and again, children are great about being creative. So I would never discourage them from trying out new things, right? So encourage them to be creative. Don't hold them to those uh, rules that I just told you, which are really more for, I think, sort of professional visualizations. Whereas I think children should just be, feel free to experiment. As long as they have fun with it, I think that's the most important thing. Good. Um, Atif. Hello, Professor. Uh, I'm audible. Yes, you are. Okay. Uh, firstly, thank you, uh, Professor, for this amazing session. It was very insightful. And my question is, I am from a management sciences. So my question is, is there any difference between uh, a visualization techniques in social sciences and pure sciences or applied sciences? Great question. Um, the short answer is no because all we're visualizing is data, right? And it doesn't really matter where this data comes from. And the principles I just told you apply throughout, through any you know, types of data sets. Having said that, there are some conventions in different disciplines, right? So statistics has certain conventions that are different, let's say from social science, they have other conventions. And then the physical and natural sciences have yet other conventions. So you have to be a little bit aware of the conventions in your field. And I would imagine in measurement science, you have certain of those co conventions. And, you know, typically it's a good idea to adhere to the convention unless you have a good reason to break with it, right? And if you do break with the convention, you probably have to explain why. Um, but that's, that's the only thing. Otherwise, um, the principles are universally true because we basically have the same you know, type of apparatus in our brain to see, right? So that's why a lot of these principles really come from the cognitive and the, you know, visual sciences. And so um, that's true throughout humanity. But it's a great question. Um, Hamsai. Hamsai, yeah? Uh, yes, sir. Hello, Hi. hello, Professor. Uh, my question is, uh, that I heard that every complex problems or uh, top topics can be converted into graphs, which is so understandable. Uh, so can you give me some basic idea how we can convert any complex uh, 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 equations or problems or topics into graphs? Yes, yeah, so I would recommend using tools, right? I think that's probably the easiest way to do this. So um, the tools that we talked about earlier, I probably would start with Excel, which I'm assuming many of you have available through your schools or you know, through your universities. Um, and you know, those tools basically get you started. You can put in data and then you can use a chart wizard to create a visualization relatively quickly. I think your question might be, what about things that go beyond those tools? Um, Unfortunately, there is kind of a gap currently, I think, between things you can easily do with, you know, these tools and things that are more complicated. And unfortunately, it requires currently programming. So you have to actually know how to program in order to create visualizations for more complex data. And that's actually part of the research that we do in my group. We work with, you know, biologists and other scientists to visualize very complex genetic data and cancer data, et cetera. And for those types of applications, we have to basically use programming um, to do that. And that's what I'm teaching in my data visualization course as well. 
we use a programming language called JavaScript for web-based um, interfaces, and we use a framework called D3. So D3 is a really nice framework to use for interactive visualizations on the web. However, it has a steep learning curve, and so it will take some time to actually know how to do that, and you do need to know some programming. I hope that answers the question. Uh, 3DAR. Uh, hi, uh, hi, Professor. I actually hi. work as a business analyst uh, in a software industry company. And recently, I started working on a dashboard. Um, so uh, while working with the dashboard, apart from the requirements, we have to visually represent and uh, take that to the development team. So uh, what uh, tools, free tools or free APIs do you suggest? Because I have seen the table you as a commercial versus a, as a licensing fee. Yeah, can you tell me again the requirements? I didn't quite hear it. Yeah, so I, uh, I'm working on a requirement that uh, that needs to visualize the uh, supply chain order management system. So uh, we need to represent the uh, data in a uh, charts or a dashboard so that um, we can give it to the customers. Okay. Now we need to use certain tools uh, which are available at a lower cost or a free cost. Do you have any suggestion for that? Uh, yes, so I believe Power BI, for anyone using Microsoft Office, I believe Power BI is free. Um, and, you know, Excel would be free as well. I've seen amazing things being done with Excel. Um, you wouldn't believe it. So if you put in the effort, you can, I think, do pretty, you can get pretty far with, with a tool like Excel, actually. And if that's not enough, you know, you you, uh, you may have to do dashboards, for example. Again, you can do dashboards in Excel, but I think Power BI would be a better tool. And again, if you have the Microsoft Office suite, then it basically comes for free with that. Good. So I think that actually is the last question. Um, thank you again for all your attention and thank you for the participation. I do have one last activity, which is in the slides. And I was asked to leave you with one last thing to think about at home. So here is what you should think about at home. Um, find an example of a good or a bad visualization and then think about why. Why is it effective or why is it not effective? I think that's a really great exercise that you can also do with your families and friends. Um, and then why do you like it or not? You know, So that's my homework for you. And I just want to thank you again. You guys have been great. And I wish you best of luck in your path, in your career path, and happy visualizing. Thanks so much, Professor Feister. Um, everyone, please send your messages in the chat so you can see them very quickly. And again, thank you to all of you for showing up, being so proactive and taking initiative and staying so engaged throughout the talk. Um, if you would like to get in touch with Professor Feister, the best way is to go through us. So please reach out to us and we will also send you information on all of the um, tools he mentioned and links he shared uh, throughout the session. Um, thank you so much, Hans Peter. So good to have you join us and, and I hope to connect with you again soon with the students. Thank you, Tara. And thanks to the whole team. You guys are doing an amazing job. And thank you guys, you were great. Thanks so much.